As Russia continues its assault on Ukraine, the world is left with the question, what happens if Russia wins? Michael Kimmage is a professor of history at the Catholic University of America and visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Michael, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So I want to first go back a bit to 2015, to Russia's involvement in the Syrian conflict. What can we learn from that? I think we can learn two things that are relevant to the current conflict in Ukraine. The first is on the U.S. or the Western side, this venture was underestimated or, or Russia's capacities were underestimated. President Obama said that it would be a quagmire for Russia. Uh, and you can see how one would want that to be the case from, uh, from a U.S. point of view. Uh, but it did not end up being the case. So there's uh, a concern I have at the moment that uh, we may be underestimating, or perhaps a week ago that we were underestimating Russia's uh, willingness to use military force and its possibility of, of doing so in a way that's successful uh, in Russian terms. Secondly, the Syrian campaign for Russia uh, was the exertion of military force, the projection of military force, uh, not to resolve the conflict, not to create a viable state in Syria. Uh, Syria remains a war zone uh, in a very chaotic place, but Russia used its military power to increase its diplomatic leverage uh, in the region. I have no idea if that's going to be the case with Ukraine. I'm somehow doubtful of that, but I think it could be the Russian reasoning uh, in Ukraine that they, that, that they drew a lesson from Syria uh, about the benefits of using military force. Well, you wrote an article and you titled it, What If Russia Wins? So how is winning defined for Russia? That's an excellent question. I think that there are two levels of success that Russia is interested in at the moment. The first is I would describe as as negative, and it's blocking certain outcomes. So to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO, to grind down the relationship between Ukraine and the United States, or between Ukraine uh, and Europe, uh, and you know that's I think the lower level ambition that Putin has. Um, and you know to that extent, you know Russia could, in quotation marks, succeed. Uh, by turning Ukraine into Syria, by turning it into a war zone uh, that would have no chances of, of, of joining the NATO alliance. Uh, so that's the, the lower level of, of aspiration that I think Putin has at the moment. The higher level of aspiration is to build a structure politically in Ukraine that's to his liking. Maybe this involves the partition of the country or the installation uh, of, a, of a puppet regime uh, in Kiev, and this would be a government that would be deferential or uh, subservient to Moscow. I think this is very wishful thinking on Putin's part. Uh, and when you see in some ways how badly the military operation has gone for Russia, uh, they're extremely far from uh, that kind of scenario. But it doesn't mean that they'll give up on, on the first scenario of, uh, of sowing chaos uh, and destroying the Ukrainian state, and sort of leaving it at that. Well, let's say they, they do accomplish that and they succeed. What does that mean for the other Eastern European countries? I mean, will Russia invade them next? I, I doubt it. Uh, you know, I think uh, when you see the commitment of resources Russia has made in Ukraine, 200,000 troops uh, and lots of military hardware, uh, and, you know, they're nowhere near militarily where they had hoped to be at this point. Uh, and if they really intend to occupy territory, it's going to bog Russia down uh, for, uh, for years to come. So there's the practical logistical side of things, which uh, would make it very difficult for Russia to move on from Ukraine. This is uh, a massive undertaking for them and one that's by no means uh, guaranteed to succeed in, in Putin's terms, of course. Uh, on the other hand, what we do have to reckon with is the terrible risks, the enormous risks Putin has undertaken in this venture. And I think that for those of us who have been longtime Putin watchers, uh, we're all surprised by that. Uh, and so we can't be surprised anymore. We do have to think through the possible risks to the Baltic republics, uh, to the NATO alliance that Putin might uh, entertain. I think outright invasion is very unlikely, but he might seek to provoke or to challenge uh, the NATO alliance in ways that could be destabilizing. And at the moment, we have to get ourselves ready for that. You know, one scenario that you mentioned would be that the United States will be in, quote, a state of permanent economic war with Russia. What do you mean? I think we're already there. Uh, you know, the sanctions are the most ambitious uh, uh, imaginable sanctions policy. They are going to uh, affect the Russian government's ability to function. They're going to have a really strong effect on the Russian economy. And unlike, I think, the 2014 sanctions, the first round uh, in this conflict, they're going to have an effect on daily life uh, in Russia. Uh, that, of course, is not going to be perceived uh, <laughs> with indifference uh, or passivity by Putin. He's going to lash out in some way, uh, perhaps with a cyber attack or you know, perhaps by withholding gas from 
uh, from Europe, and then there will be a kind of obligation on the Western side uh, to respond or to, to, to escalate. So we are in a very intense phase of conflict being fought uh, through economic means, uh, and I think it's difficult. I very much hope that we can keep the economic and the military tracks separate, but it's often difficult to, to do that in practice. And so to say that we're in a state of economic warfare, it sounds shocking to me, uh, but I think it's just a fact at this point. So what would the new world order look like in the event of a Russian victory? And then what would the U.S., what would the U.S.'s strategy be? I'll say from the, from the, from the outset that I think uh, Russian victory over the long term in Ukraine to me is very improbable. I think that this war uh, is going to fail for Russia, but I suspect it may fail in four or five years, uh, which is, of course, catastrophic for, uh, for Ukraine and catastrophic for the rest of us. So in the very long term, I think uh, this war may prove to be less transformational than it feels uh, at the moment. But... Uh, to develop the argument from the situation where we are uh, at the moment, uh, what we have is uh, a vortex of instability uh, that's there in the center of Europe. Uh, we might think of Switzerland as the center of Europe, but the geography would suggest that Ukraine is at the center of Europe. You can look back historically and say the First and Second World Wars are both wars about Ukraine. You know, they sort of are fought there to a great extent uh, and have lots to do with the uh, with the origins of those two wars. So. This is a part of Europe that has the potential to be stabilized uh, considerably, uh, and you know we have to look at this new uh, this new Europe. We have NATO. Uh, I think the Biden administration has done a great job uh, of shoring it up. But NATO now looks upon a real abyss of insecurity on many of its borders, from Turkey uh, and the Black Sea to Romania and Bulgaria uh, to you know Poland and the Baltic. Uh, Republic. So NATO was structured for a more peaceful world, I would say. It's now going to have to deal uh, with a more chaotic world, and that will be a real challenge. And, and Michael, I mean, quickly, some analysts are calling this Putin's Afghanistan. Do you, do you agree with that? I do in the very long term, but it's also uh, somewhat premature. We're in day five or six of the, uh, of the war, uh, and uh, we still don't know exactly what Putin's intentions are. I could imagine him withdrawing in some ways. Uh, and trying to find workarounds for uh, for an insurgency. I, you know, we have to guard against wishful thinking that this will, uh, in some quick way, be a failure. Actually, Afghanistan was a, a 10 year project or, or eight, nine year project for the Soviet Union. It took them a long time uh, to fail. But I think that there's something analytically that's fundamentally correct about that. Uh, it will be unbelievably difficult uh, for Russia to occupy a country that's among the largest in Europe with a population of some 40 million. Uh, in a population that clearly does not wish to be occupied. All right. Well, Michael, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.